Welcome to the last video about the application layer. In this video, we will discuss the X server or the X11 server more formally. The X server is a server that enables a user to use some sort of a central service and then get graphical output displayed at the point where the user is using the service or even at some other points uh, to have graphical output displayed. This server differs from most of the other servers that we've encountered in that the server does not run on the central machine where the main program, where the main software may be running. This typically would be running on the terminals where the users are sitting. Nowadays, those terminals would typically be personal computers. The terminals may also be independent displays where no one in particular is using the system from. And the server is running on those terminals and rendering whatever this central software tells them to render. So often different output will be displayed to different users depending on the user's need to consume that information. The video is not only intended to show the flexibility of the client-server architecture, but also to let you think a bit wider about the use of distributed systems. In so many cases, when we think about networks, we think about a user who is using a service on some server, and very often that server will nowadays be somewhere in the cloud. However, it is entirely possible to have a server that runs, and even multiple servers running, that solves some problem and then displays information at various places throughout an organization, throughout a country, throughout a continent. And in that manner enables users to obtain the appropriate information that they need. And X is one of those uh, services that provides you with such functionality. So the idea is to broaden your thinking about distributed systems to let you think wider than the typical thoughts of where a user sits in front of a terminal or some remote uh, workstation and accesses a central server. The idea is to think about designing systems where you can interact with uh, services that are provided at various locations throughout the network. And in this particular case, they happen to be display services. Since this video deals with displays, let's start our discussion by talking about some displays. Let's not immediately start to talk about digital displays. Let's start with some analog displays. We will do that because those displays are examples of what you are most probably familiar with in the context that we want to use displays here. Our example will be the simple instrumentation of an automobile. The speedometer and the rev counter or revolution counter that you find in many vehicles. In order to make some of our examples realistic, we're also going to at this point introduce the notion of ergonomics. The idea that a user should be presented with information in a manner that makes the most sense to the user at that point. One of the principles in an automobile, in a car, is that uh, typically when you are in the appropriate gear, the rev counter and the speedometer will be aligned. The needles will be pointing in the same direction and you have to change gears whenever they are not aligned. Now, there are many cases where they are not aligned for specific reasons, such as when you are accelerating, 
But in general, while just driving around, you expect them to be aligned. And the important point why we are using this example is that when you glance down, when you take your eyes from the road and you simply glance down to the instrumentation panel, you can very quickly pick up the appropriate information see what speed you're driving at, and also at the same glance, see whether you're in the appropriate gear. And as we use more and more complex examples, you will see that this becomes more and more important. Now, it is true that many vehicles nowadays do have digital displays. They no longer have real analog displays. But in many of those cases, also, they will not display the information in a pure digital fashion, but they will still emulate an analog display. And it is precisely for these ergonomic reasons why it will do so. Here is a simple animation that illustrates this notion with the speedometer and the ref counter. As you can see, the idea is that they should stay in alignment for a little while. If they do not, then you need to do something to change it. In the more realistic example that follows, you can see that the car pulls away from a traffic light and initially the RPMs, the rev counter uh, increases, but then as the car gets to a more uh, normal speed, the gears are changed to keep the rev counter and the speedometer more or less aligned. One way of thinking about a computerized car is to see the car control system as some central server that controls everything and then you have your various instruments that are interested in information from the central control system. So in this example, the speedometer and the ref counter are two instruments, and there may in fact be many more, but these are the two that we're using at the moment, and they then have to obtain information from this uh, car control system, this uh, car management system. In our first scenario, uh, we are using a typical client server architecture for that. Now, that is totally unrealistic. That is not that we'd ever do it like that. But what you can see there is that the instruments are sending requests to this car control system and they do so at ad hoc uh, times. In some cases, two requests arrive and the car control system can only service one at a time and therefore the information is not received immediately. Uh, such a client-server architecture uh, is simply not one that will work in this situation. What we rather need is something where we can get what we would probably call push notifications. Again, a real car works very differently, but in terms of a digital equivalent, let's look at such a push type of system. In this system, the car control system pushes the information to the various instruments when it deems it necessary. In other words, if there is something that needs to be updated. Now again, this example is artificial uh, because there is no reason why you would want to update the one instrument and not the other instrument. But it gives you an indication of how the central management system can take information push it out to various parties who may need the information and ideally format it in a manner that is appropriate for those parties. For most of what we will be using in our examples to follow, we will assume that the displays are digital screens and that the instruments that we talk about 
can actually be drawn as graphical images on those screens. Our examples may not be very realistic, but hopefully they do make the point uh, that we do need such systems. Our second example or our second scenario that we want to consider is one of an aircraft. If you look at the instrument panel of an aircraft, then you know that there are many, many more pieces of information that needs to be supplied to the pilot. And the principles that we saw from ergonomics apply again. So a pilot can indeed look at this set of instruments and if they are all aligned, then presumably everything's well with the plane and the pilot can look to the front of the plane again or look at a map or, or talk to a tower or do whatever pilots need to do when they don't look at the instruments. So with single glance, you can get a picture of those instruments. However, if one of the instruments is not aligned, then it means something is amiss and it will immediately be picked up by the pilot and then the pilot will have to take emergency steps to solve that problem. The moment that we move to a bigger plane, we often increase the number of pilots. A typical airliner will have at least two pilots, the captain and the first officer, or we'll refer to them as the pilot and the co-pilot, and what they have is a large set of instruments that are spread around the flight cabin. Dual head-up displays, or HUDs, are standard on the 787. The HUD displays critical flight information on retractable see-through screens positioned in front of each pilot's eyes. The HUD allows each pilot to see the big picture and critical flight information at the same time. If we move to other aircraft uh, of a similar nature, you may also have a navigator on board. And the navigator is the person who in principle gets the plane to its destination. The type of information that is of interest to the navigator will still include things like the speed of the plane and the altitude and so on. The navigator may want to switch between various views. The navigator may, for example, at some stage want to look at the map of an area over which we are going to fly. And then at another time, the navigator may want to look at the output from the weather radar. If we change the scenario slightly and we move to a fighter plane, then again, you may have two pilots. But if you have two pilots, they tend to sit behind one another. And therefore, you cannot display all the instruments that you could display on an airliner where you had both sets of eyes on all the instruments. So you have to be more selective in what you display to each of these two pilots. And the two pilots may in fact play different roles. The co-pilot may in fact be a weapons specialist. And this weapon specialist may be able to fly the plane and may get enough information about the plane to be able to fly it normally. There's a lot more going on in the backseat of a fighter jet than you think. Those backseaters aren't just there for a joyride. They operate weapon systems. The weapon specialist may actually be interested in information such as wind currents that may have an impact on the weapon when it is launched. For example, if a bomb is to be dropped or a missile is to be launched or something like that, uh, then other information becomes more relevant to this weapon specialist than the typical information that is displayed to the pilot. Peace Carbon 5 pilot First Lieutenant Nicholas Fighter Tai says the weapon systems operator gives pilots the ability to have a smaller range of focus in order to effectively accomplish the mission. So while the pilot might be focused on the air-to-air -air fight out there, the Wizzo is able to get ready for a strike. Wizzos have to adjust to every pilot they fly with to keep the crew alive and accomplish the mission. With Red Flag Alaska being a realistic air-to-air -air exercise, it's safe to say that weapon systems officers strive to be on top of their game. Reporting from Eielson Air Force Base, I'm Tech Sergeant Joe Wollston. The point is that the system displays information on various display units in a manner that is most appropriate for the consumers 
of that information. And that's the general message that you will see coming through all of the examples that we are looking at. To convince you even more of the fact that we may want different sets of information to be displayed by a single system, consider our next scenario, that of spaceflight. In the case of a spacecraft, you may have a pilot and a co-pilot, but you also have an entire mission control system. And as you are aware, there are lots of people in that mission control system and they are all watching their screens and they are observing different aspects of the mission. Now, the mission may be controlled by some mission control system. This is most probably some sort of a distributed system and this distributed system may act as an integrated system at least as far as some of the role players are concerned. So this distributed system will push some information or display some information on some of the parties who are involved in this mission's displays, but in a manner that is most appropriate for them. So the people on board of the spacecraft may get certain information displayed to them, information that may deal with their immediate surroundings and the actions that they are actually able to take, whereas some engineers may get much more detailed information on the ground, information that they can analyze and stare at for a long time, information that they can use to determine exactly how this spacecraft is performing during its flight. Let's move away from our uh, steering examples that car and the plane and let's move to a scenario that is more realistic in the sense that this is a more typical scenario that one will find in the real world. Let's consider the use of a central computer that controls let's say a factory floor or a power generation plant or some other industrial facility. As a more realistic example of everything that we've discussed, consider some electricity plant. So there may be a generator, and this generator is operated by someone who needs to interact with it frequently, monitor outputs, and also send commands to it to either increase the amount of electricity that is generated, or uh, obtain other values from this uh, generator. Uh, the plant manager typically needs an overview of all the generators in the plant, and this generator simply needs to push the information to the plant manager every once in a while. The power distribution center also needs to know what's going on at this electricity generator, specifically how the generators are performing, so that it can plan distribution. And then as a perhaps not so important party, the fuel supplier may be interested in fuel consumption and therefore they also need information. Now in this uh, first uh, scenario, the first example, we are using a client server architecture again where all the various parties send requests to the central uh, generator and it then either responds if it can or if not then it waits a little bit and then it responds. Uh, now again this is totally unrealistic it gives you a feeling for how a direct client server architecture would have been used. What is necessary is something where this uh, generator and with the generator we are uh, implying some sort of a facility that does not only generate the electricity but is a complex digital system. So this electricity generator will be able to display the information at the various parties who need it in a format that is appropriate for these various parties. So again, we need a push system, not going to illustrate that, but the same as what we saw in the car example earlier in the video, the central system will push out the information 
in the appropriate format at the appropriate times to the parties that need it. As a first demonstration of the use of X Windows to facilitate such a remote display, we will be running some commands on a Linux computer and you can see the shell here in green and behind that we have a Windows computer and the black area is currently controlled by an X server on that Windows computer. In order to operate it, we had to open the firewall so that it allows incoming traffic on uh, the relevant port, port 6000 for the X server. And we also had to disable access control on the X server. Normally, one would leave the access control open because one wants the system to be secure. However, for the purposes of this demonstration, it simplifies matters to just have access control switched off. Let us just look at our details of our Linux computer using a pretty large font here to try and make it readable to you. So it's going to be messy. But there you can see the IP address of the Linux computer from which we are working, 10.1.1.15. The Windows computer that we are using happens to be 10.1.1.2. And the program that we will use to demonstrate how this works is one of those typical old programs that everybody knows about, and it is the X clock and we are going to say it should use as a display this windows machine and more than that it should use the physical display of this windows machine and when i run that you see the clock appearing in the upper left hand corner of that uh, x window of that display However, you can also see that it is being controlled by this Linux computer. Uh, this Linux computer at the moment cannot accept another input uh, because it is running the clock. What I should have done uh, if I wanted it uh, to continue and leave the clock up there for me, then I should have run this program in the background. Let's break that program and you can immediately see when we break it that the clock disappears and we can enter another command. What I'm going to do this time around is I am going to ask it to display the clock uh, somewhat bigger and I'm going to ask it to use a geometry of 500 by 500 and we might as well run this in the background so i'm going to provide the ampersand so that we will get the command uh, line back immediately and you should see the clock appear immediately and uh, there it happened you can see the process number of this process that uh, we have just created 20383 so if we want to stop that clock, we can kill that process. Another program that is also used for demonstration purposes that has absolutely no value on its own is the XIs program. So XIs, and again, we will say display. And we are sending this to the same display. And... I used a colon there that I should not have used, so let's get rid of that. And there you can see the eyes appearing. Now, what you can't see is that those eyes are following my mouse pointer. Yeah, fun to play with, but as I said, pretty useless. I can also change the, the geometry of that, and that would then be displayed bigger. Another program that is somewhat more useful is the X terminal. And again, we can tell it which display to use, and it should again use the window machine. Exactly the same display. I'm not going to run this one in the background immediately, because as you can see, it opens up a tiny display. 
what I rather want to do is to make it somewhat bigger and I can again specify its geometry and uh, let's use a 500 by 500 geometry for it unfortunately the font is still more or less unreadable the command on this particular server that should enable me to choose fonts does not work at the moment and i will therefore take this demonstration to another machine just to show you that this actually does work i am going to type something in that command window at the moment at that prompt and i can for example say l is dash l and you can hopefully figure out that a couple are being displayed in the meantime you can see that the command line that i entered initially is still waiting for uh, me to return to it i didn't start it in the background so the moment that i close this by pushing ctrl d i am going back and i can now uh, enter commands again in this particular window that i've used previously so let's leave the windows machine alone for a bit and move to a different machine for this example we will be using the x server x sdl that you can see displayed on this uh, android tablet so let's activate that gives you a little bit of an advertisement and then provides us with information about the font and so on and then it provides us with some instructions about how to use it now let us bring our linux machine back into view and what we're going to do is to uh, follow the instructions there and that will set the environment variable with a name called display and it will point to the ip address of our tablet and more specifically will it talk about the display unit number zero that's the physical display the first and only physical display and what we can do now is run the various commands that we would have run otherwise as one example we can run x eyes but now without saying where the display will be so we previously i had to specify it explicitly for every command i can now just use the value because they set in a specific variable i may want to change the eyes to be a bit bigger and let's make them 200 by 200 and there you can see them uh, being displayed it's a bit harder to illustrate how they work because on the tablet uh, one has to sort of move a cursor with your finger into the field of view uh, we can play around with that a little bit and make it 400 by 400 just to illustrate the difference there and now they're slightly bigger but we can still get them to follow the cursor again the moment that we break the program on our linux machine then uh, the eyes disappear let's do something more useful i want to open a terminal here and i'm going to run xterm for the x terminal i'm going to use a geometry of 70 characters by 20 lines i want a monospaced font and to make things fairly easy to read i am going to use a font size of 20 and the moment that i do that we have a terminal that appears and you can see this linux machine is still waiting for us to complete what we were doing but let's move that out of the way now i'm typing on the android ta tablet and i can for example just for the sake of illustration say ls-l in this terminal that is open on the tablet and you can see that uh, there's quite a lot of output 
In fact, it uh, exceeds the number of lines available, so not all the lines are displayed, but I can clear the display and we can get back to whatever I want to do. So here I have a terminal and I can operate this to get back to the X command. Since I am now in an X environment, it will uh, run something like X clock and okay does complain about uh, fonts that are not available that's not important and on the tablet i'm pushing break now and i am back into a context where i can enter other commands now let's begin to do something that looks a bit more interesting and i'm going to run firefox on the command line on the tablet so remember that i'm in an x terminal and i'm actually running firefox on the linux machine once we are on the address bar i can for example on the tablet say that we want to go to youtube.com and there we get youtube as displayed uh, by the linux server and uh, we might as well then uh, search on YouTube. Uh, in the search bar, let's look for my channel that I'm using for these lectures. And there we go. And there is a video about the presentation layer. And I can now begin to play it. And this is bound to be very, very slow because what we have at the moment is the Linux machine pulling in the video, but then rendering it on the X server. Clearly, X is not an optimal mechanism if you want to, for example, watch videos. We have also run into a different type of problem, namely, how do we quit this? And we can try our typical commands, control Q and so on. So what we have here is our Firefox in a spin. It is sitting on top of the terminal from which we activated it. There are no commands that we can use to exit it. Our only way back into the system is to bring the command line back that we initially opened up and if we push control break there then we are out and you will see that all the processes that are started on this X server have been killed. The previous demonstration may have left you with an incorrect impression of how X is used in modern computing environments. So let's uh, look at how it is typically used in a computing environment. And uh, secondly, in our previous example, we ended up with a lot of X artifacts being displayed on top of one another. And we needed to solve that problem. And we're also going to address the solution to that problem in this demonstration. So what we have here is a typical Windows computer and I'm going to use SSH to access the computer. However, what I want to do with this computer is I want to tunnel its X commands via this SSH connection. In other words, it should be encrypted uh, which will make it relatively secure. I don't have to bypass all the security that I bypassed uh, to make the previous example work. So one can either say tunnel the X uh, commands or the X sequences via this connection. However, that needs me to set up some authorization files and uh, I am not in a position to do that right now. So Y is an option that does the same as X. It uh, tunnels the X commands via this encrypted channel and uh, 
it uh, does not uh, need you to open up any additional ports or uh, change any rules in the firewall. So let's go to Navplan and log in. Going to ask me for password, and there you can see what I caused by using the dash Y rather than the dash X. What I can do here because I'm tunneling the X display is that I can simply ask it to let's say execute X clock. So I'm not going to say anything more. It will try and use its local display on that Linux computer but it will be tunneled back to my computer, this Windows computer, where an X server is currently running. Uh, one of the things that is clearly different in the current example is that it did not pop up on a special display. It rather popped up in a little uh, window of its own. And this is the solution. This is what we need. We need some sort of a window manager that will take all these widgets, whether they are caused by X or by something else, and manage them. So suddenly you will see that we have the typical Windows type control over this, and we can even resize it. This is exactly what this window manager enables us to do. We can also stretch it out uh, vertically and uh, there we have a nice big clock. It's the same sort of setup. Uh, our command line is still managing this window. So if I go back to this command line and I push Control C to break it, then the clock is gone. Now let's start it again, but this time run it in the background. There is our clock. I'm just going to resize that slightly and pull it over. Let's now go to our other command line uh, or our other command prompt that we have on this machine. And what I'm going to do on this particular one is I'm going to use SSH. And in the same fashion, I'm going to ask it to tunnel our X commands for us and this time i'm going to the machine that i've used so often in the previous videos and we are in you can again see the same warning that i got earlier because i'm using the dash y and not the dash x so let us also open a clock on this computer so again x clock and i'm going to run it in the background yet again it should also be connected to my Windows uh, X server. And when I enter the command, you can see there I have my clock from my second display. Uh, there it is maximized. You won't see everything. Let's minimize it again. And uh, we can also resize this and drag it around. So there we have two clocks and uh, this is being output by the Linux machine in blue and that one is being output by the Linux machine that we are using in green there. Let's run our X terminal from this machine and I'm going to again use the um, monospace font and I'm going to make it another nice big font so that you can see what I'm typing. Let's make it uh, 36 now. And I did not end that command properly, so it's sitting there waiting for me to either break it or whatever, but uh, let's leave it for the time being. And there you can see that I'm into this uh, particular computer. If I now want to vim etc protocols. So I am working on uh, my uh, Styx computer that we've used so often. Uh, 
for the time being, let's just exit this one. Let's show you another nice uh, little demonstration program. I'm going to run this one in the background. And uh, suddenly you see the old screen being filled up as an aquarium. Fish sw swimming all over the place. However, I can still go back to all these other windows that I had opened. And we can uh, continue working with the fish swimming in the background. Uh, on this machine, I can open the calculator. Uh, it's the X calculator. And there is my calculator now. It's open in a little window of its own. I can also resize that. And uh, font is a bit small, so it may be a bit hard to read. But if I want to say one plus, or rather one plus, two equals, uh, it's three if you can't read it. So again, uh, my window is working. I should perhaps just have chosen a bigger font. The bottom line with this is I can SSH into as many hosts as I want to and I can get all my graphical output on this single X server, which at the moment happens to be a Windows machine, but it can be a Linux machine, it can be uh, any machine that supports an X server. It is time for another demonstration. In this case, I'm going to use our Stix Linux computer, and I am going to use multiple displays. First of all, we might as well get the fish tank background going on all of them just to show that we have connectivity. So if I were to run AS fish tank and I were to run it on 10.1.2.116 and to say display zero, then that should display the fish tank on my cell phone. If I were to do the same, but this time uh, use 195, which is the address on which the tablet is plugged in, then I should get it on the tablet. And if I would use uh, 152, then it should display it on the uh, laptop. In this case, I'm not going to use an ampersand, so the other two processes are running in the background and uh, obviously I should have set display zero and uh, now it uh, is displaying on the laptop as well. You can see uh, it is hanging on the terminal side because uh, it is waiting for that process to finish. That process is not going to finish so I am going to stop this command and that will stop the fish tank on the laptop. Now, if I want to use something that is not merely a background, suppose I want to display the time, then I can say display the time for me and display it on, let's say, on the laptop. So it's 10.1.2.152. We should use display zero. And I'm going to say display it as a pretty large uh, clock. So geometry of, let's say, about 500 by... 500 and in this case I'm going to use the ampersand so that it runs in the background and we have our clock running on the laptop. If we want to start the eyes on the cell phone then we can uh, say let's use x eyes and say the display is equal to 10.1.2.116 and again we have to specify display number zero I also want the eyes to be pretty big, so let's also use a geometry of about 500 by 500 and uh, use the ampersand so that it runs in the background. And uh, ideally what I should do now is to move the mouse or my finger across that cell phone so that you can see that the eyes are moving or following it, but we're not going to do that for this little demonstration. To make this a bit more uh, uh, useful, we can in principle display the terminal 
and let's put this terminal on the tablet so it's 10.1.2 dot uh, with a tablet on 195 it's display number zero that i want to use and i want a pretty large uh, terminal there so that it's useful so let's say 200 by 200 characters going to run it in the background we do get a complaint here about fonts that are not available i could have avoided that but that's not the big issue we do have our terminal and we can use it so hopefully what this demonstration does is that it gives you the feeling that we can run a system in some central location and that it can display its output all across the world because we are displaying these two uh, IP addresses that can be absolutely anywhere in the world. Here the displays are clustered together so that we can get them in one frame but in general they can be absolutely anywhere and uh, this hopefully gives you the ability to think a little bit wider about uh, using distributed systems to provide different parties with information that is relevant to them yes the clock and the terminal and so on are toy applications but we could easily have displayed uh, information relevant to a nuclear reactor for example to the various parties who need to get relevant information that is not always the same for every party who needs to get it this concludes our discussion of the application layer. Hopefully this video did enable you to think slightly wider about a distributed system. A system that sits somewhere and perhaps consists of multiple units that interact and uh, it is a far cry from your typical scenario where a single user accesses something that happens to be somewhere in this cloud and uh, is simply used over a distance, some remote service. We need to think wider, and that was the whole purpose of this final video. Our next video moves down to layer 6, the presentation layer. See you then. Thank you.